Naval architects and engineers, we admittedly create a lot of boring reports. Uh, but a stability letter is not one of them. It looks like another boring report, but it really acts as a safety manual. Ignore it at your peril. Preparation is key when you're going to sea, and the exact details of that preparation change depending on the specific ship you're on. A stability letter is the manual that explains many of those details for your specific ship. Now the problem with stability letters isn't the math, it's communication. These are not easy documents to read, and they are very boring. In fact, this video was inspired by another article I read in Maritime Technology by Darren Manzingo. He explained that for small vessels, the major problem with stability letters is explaining it to the captains. And there's a beautiful quote from that article. Backed into a corner and left to their own devices, our mariners will disregard the stability guidance and do what they know has worked before. Nobody has walked them through the contents of their stability letters one sentence at a time to make sure they understand it. So today, that's what we're doing. I will review a stability letter and give plain English interpretation for all of that boring mumbo jumbo. Let's do this. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Commercial ships, they're a world apart from recreational yachts. Now don't hate me just yet, I don't want to diss on yachts, but comparing them to commercial ships is like comparing the space shuttle to a Cessna airplane. They are both flying vehicles, but they're built for very different missions. That doesn't mean that yachts are bad, that just means that they're not built to handle the mission of a commercial ship. Commercial ships do contend with what I would call tougher requirements, so they need far more safety features. Well, that could just be boasting on my part. What are these supposed differences? How is the commercial ship safer? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at that, shall we? Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. You've decided that you want the electric yacht. You have done your due diligence and sorted out myth from fact. Excellent. Now it's time to make the big purchase. Actually, purchases, multiple. This isn't like buying a used car where it only comes in the color that you see. Going electric, it requires you to design a whole custom electric system for your ship. It's more akin to building a custom home. Don't worry, we can organize this. The challenge with electric systems is the interaction. The requirements for just one minor component may determine the key settings for the whole system. Well, that strategy can leave you lost and confused if you don't have some sort of organization behind it. So today I'm going to cover some of the key settings for your electric system. After deciding these points, the complexity of shopping should simplify into a few simple paths. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Yes, electric propulsion needs to keep you safe especially in emergency scenarios. When you're fighting against the storm and struggling to stay off the rocks, will electric propulsion hold up to the job? So how to design an electric system that is fit for emergencies and ready to keep you safe? Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. The batteries form one of the most expensive components in electric propulsion. 
but this is not because of their complexity. With batteries, you simply need a lot of them. And that can become a serious challenge when you're considering things like space and weight, since the batteries are also very heavy. Weight is a bad thing for ships. So today I'm going to review the common choices for battery chemistries, the pros and cons to each one, and suggest some general strategies to help you decide whether you should invest in the expensive batteries or go for bargain basement. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. You know, I remember this one time when I was doing an inspection of a ship and they wanted me to look at some potential damage to their hull. So here I am in this tug, I'm crawling down into the bowels of the ship, looking around at the sides of the hull, you know, looking for this damage. I mean, it's fairly dim lit, there's not a whole lot of lighting. And then I look over to the starboard side and I see daylight, a giant two foot long crack in the side of the hull, daylight just streaming in. I mean, I could stick my hand through this crack. And I'm just thinking, well, that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> and this was really an interesting job to work on because obviously the owner wanted that part fixed. Uh, they wanted to repair the crack but more importantly, they wanted to know why it had cracked. How this story started is we had a tug that was originally designed for just inland service, just going on rivers, small lakes. The owner then decided to take that tug and bring it out to coastal service, traveling along the edges of the ocean. So that's lesson number one. When the engineer says it's not rated for coastal, there's probably a reason behind that. But lesson number two, because this is the part that really puzzled them, is they, they recognized, this owner, they thought that yes, taking it past its limits is a little dangerous. I should test it first and be careful. So they took the tug out onto the coast on a very bad stormy day. They tested it and everything seemed fine. Nothing broke. Three months later, they get this giant crack in their hull. And so they're asking, what on earth happened? How could it not be f having, or how could it have no problems at all at the beginning? And then three months later, I'm looking at a broken ship. The answer is fatigue. Fatigue is one of the most dominant features in the structural design of ships. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm specifically going to talk about fatigue, not from the theoretical, but from the practical end of things. You know, we have the theory that you learn in school, all of the equations, all of the laws of physics, that's the rules of the game. The practical part of structural design though is how to win the game, the guidelines, the conservative simplifications. And that's really important with fatigue because you're going to find out it's about looking at the small details of connections on a ship. And there are just too many small details on a ship to theoretically handle them all. Theory is difficult. Theory takes time and effort. Practical design, on the other hand, what we're looking at today, is learning some simplified rules and best practices that will work for 90% of those joints. And so we're going to finish off this three-part lecture series with fatigue. Well, how do you avoid it? How do we guarantee a long life for our ship? Uh, because this is one thing I do want to emphasize with this. Fatigue sets the ultimate death date for your ship. All of your ships, fatigue will be the one thing that finally says there's no repairing it, there's no upgrading the engines, you can't fix anything more on the ship, it's for the scrap bin. Fatigue is that final end date where there's nothing else you can do and you just have to retire the ship. So what we're really talking about with fatigue control is we're talking about how to extend the life of our ship, how to get more value out of our investment. 
because the longer this ship is running and in service, the more return we're getting on that initial build cost. Well, the answer is avoid hard spots. Sounds simple, right? Except what are hard spots? Uh, hard spots are any location on a ship where you have a sudden change in the structural stiffness. A great example is if you have a longitudinal stiffener that's joining up against a bulkhead. The stiffener is one of the weakest parts of structure on the ship. It's a small thing that you have lots of little duplicates of. Uh, the bulkhead, on the other hand, is a very large piece of ship structure. It's one of the stiffest and strongest pieces of structure that we integrate into our ship. And so when you have a weak thing moving, pushing up against almost an immovable object. That's a hard spot right there, that junction between the two. Uh, and you can see examples of this in this FEA model. So all the spots that I have highlighted and circled in red there, those are stress concentrations, areas where we have junctions of structure, and you can see there are little red spots in the FEA output showing that, yes, the, the stresses are higher there. Now, this is where we have to differentiate between stress concentration and hard spot. A stress concentration is something that we've verified with theory. We've proven it with physics and analysis. Hard spot is our term on the practical end of ship design of saying it usually turns into a stress concentration there. Best practice, previous history has told us that that looks like a hard spot. The difference between these two, stress concentration takes me about a week of analysis to prove. Hard spot, I can look at for 30 seconds and say yes. So that's the first thing is we're using hard spots as a filtering mechanism to see where do we need to concentrate our attention because Every one of those, like I said, leads to stress concentration. And stress concentration is just what we're seeing in the graph. It, you have your normal low distributed stresses along your stiffener, and then right there at the junction, that one spot is getting much higher stresses. Higher stresses lead to accelerated fatigue. Uh, the physics behind it basically says that the higher your stress level, the quicker your fatigue is going to destroy that piece of structure. And so this is how it happens on ships. This is how ships die. You don't have an entire stiffener suddenly shatter. You could have a 20 meter long stiffener. Now, you paid hundreds of dollars for that stiffener to put it in your boat. Uh, but it's just the little tiny one millimeter section right at the end that's going to break. That's the fatigue failure. And that's because of the hard spots. So we're going to focus on all of those intersections of stiffeners and bulkheads and all of the other points where structures cross and connect with each other. And this is one of the things that the shipyards will do quite a bit in detailed design. So they're going to look at all of these small details and they are going to say, what is the best practice method for how to bring these two structures together? And so let's look at those end connections. You've got three basic options for how to join a stiffener together without a hard spot. Your first option is a snipe, which looks like this. You, so you can see the green there. That's our th three stiffeners running along the bottom of some hull structure. And the teal blue, that the light shaded blue, that is your bulkhead. Now, notice some important things here. Whoops. Ah. I can't, I, I can only point this far before I go vanish from the existence. Uh, notice how this stiffener, it's not touching the bulkhead. We intentionally cut it short of the bulkhead. It stops short and doesn't actually directly connect to the bulkhead. So remember how I said that a stiffener pushing up against a strong bulkhead, that's a really bad hard spot. Here, we've eliminated that problem by just not touching the bulkhead. The other thing we do is you notice how the stiffener, it's actually tapered down. We've cut the end of it to taper it down. That taper is reducing the bending stiffness right at the end. We're making it more compliant so they can easily curve up and down right at the end of the stiffener. Now, you won't see this in real life. When I'm talking about curving up and down and pushing in and out, I'm talking movements of 
about 0 0.01 millimeters. It's nothing that the eye can detect, but the structure, the steel, notices it and cares about it. So that's why we would use a, a snipe here to really, instead of trying to transfer the stresses, we're just going to let them be completely flexible right at the end. Now, that flexibility though does have a restriction. It means that since the stiffener is not touching the bulkhead, the hull plate on the bottom is responsible for bridging that gap, for bringing that, all of those stresses from the stiffener through to the bulkhead. And so you can really only use this technique for smaller ships or non-critical structures, things that are lightly loaded because that bottom plate has to do double duty. It has to both hold back hydrostatic pressure and also act as its own stiffener for a short distance. Well, like I said, that's limited in its applications. So what are our other options? Uh, we really do want options that are easy to fabricate. Uh, you know, we're trying to think assembly line style here. What's something that we can just plop down 20, 30 stiffeners and start uh, welding without thinking too much? That would be a uh, carry through. So in a carry through option, this is typically done when you have a web frame, which is the this big deep stiffener here, and this is intersecting with our smaller uh, dark green stiffeners. And then what you can see here is we just simply cut a hole in the bottom of the web frame. The stiffeners pass straight through it. You can see those holes there. Now a couple details to notice about that hole. You can see that we're not actually cutting the hole to exactly the same size as the stiffener. Uh, we have some hole, some snipes at the corners to allow room for welds to pass through. So it does provide a little bit of connection, but we're not really getting a huge transfer of stresses between our stiffener and our web frame here. Uh, I will, but the main reason you would do this, easier welding. Notice that in this scenario here, I don't have to cut each one of my stiffeners at individual spots. And remember, this web frame, you could encounter this every two to three meters. So if I'm trying to put this in, say, a 50 meter long hold, it's much easier to just create a lot of 50 meter long stiffeners rather than chopping them up into thousands of little two meter long pieces. That's why we want you to do this carry through option so that you can just have one continuous stiffener that you put down, you weld that down, and then you weld the web frames on top. Come on. PowerPoint's not agreeing with me. There we go. But the biggest limitation there is you don't get any support for the bending moment on the stiffeners. Uh, these stiffeners ideally you know, they're trying to bend, they're carrying that bending moment, that uh, stress, all the way to their ends. And ideally, you want something at the end to take that stress and distribute it outwards. Carrying through the web frame does not do that because the stiffener is only connected right at the top edges. And that still is not restricting the uh, angle, the bending of the stiffener. And so it's not really going to carry out, uh, take out a lot of that bending moment. Still, as you can see, it's very useful for high production assembly line style. Uh, there's another big limitation to this that's a downside. You notice how I'm cutting these holes in the bottom of my web frame. Well, that means that if I have holes all the way in my web frame, the continuous part, the, the parts of my web frame that I can rely on, doesn't really start until above the holes, which means I generally have to make my web frame twice as deep so that I still have the strength part on top. So there's some extra structure there, extra weight, extra cost, but less labor. Then, now we come to option three, my favorite, brackets. <sighs> brackets come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and they are, in fact, such a wonderful, useful solution that many class societies in their structural details just flat out say that if you're going to connect a stiffener to a bulkhead, you better have a bracket. That it's written right into the rules. 
saying that if you're going to make this a hard connection, put a bracket there. But you'll see that in this demo, there's a lot of different examples. We have all the way over here at the right, uh, that is a giant bracket that they first had to weld on the uh, web frame, and then they also welded a flange on top of the bracket, making that giant T. Uh, and it's curved. You know, that, that takes a lot of effort to build. Whereas you have a simpler version here in the middle. We still have a flange on top, uh, but it's just a straight bracket. That one's quite a bit easier. Uh, you can just cut that out of a piece of flat plate, bend the flange over, and start welding. That's a faster fabrication method, but not as perfect of a transfer. And then all the way over to the left, we have the simplest method of all, is it's just a single piece of flat plate, smack it onto the side of the stiffener, weld the side, weld to the bulkhead, done. And if there are any welders listening in, I I'm aware that it's a lot harder than that, but it sounds cute if I make it seem easy. Okay, now, why do I love brackets? Why do I think that they are just the most amazing thing ever? Well, there's a lot of good reasons for them. First off, brackets make stiffeners stronger. The, the way that stresses are distributed in a beam, and all stiffeners are beams, the method of that distribution depends on what kind of support, what kind of connection we're providing at the ends of the stiffener. So brackets are what we call a fixed support, meaning that we're not allowing the ends to rotate. We've got enough stiffness there that the ends are pretty well locked in position and they're not rotating. That actually does quite a bit to reduce the peak, the maximum stress that occurs along the length of that beam. Uh, the maximum stress is only two thirds of what you would have if these were just simple um, sniped connections. So that's really useful. That means if my peak stress is only two thirds of what I would have if I was just using sniped connections, that means my stiffener can get smaller. My stiffener can get lighter. I'm saving weight and I'm saving cost. All good things. Now, the other option though, or the other thing that we really like about them is the weld area. So you notice how I showed here that you've got these, these brackets are, you've got a giant one here that's attaching along the top edge of the stiffener, and we've got one all the way over on the side here that's just slapped onto the side. All of those, you have to think about the length of the weld, this connection here between the, the um, bracket and the stiffener, how long is that compared to the length of the stiffener itself where it would join to the bulkhead? You need more weld area when you're joining these things together. You generally need about twice as much weld area as the stiffener's cross-sectional area is. So as an example, if I had a stiffener that has um, 10, millimeters, 10 millimeter squared cross-sectional area, I need to somehow change the shape at my intersection so that I have 20 square millimeters of area to weld against. Uh, I, I'm fudging the numbers there quite a bit, but just to give you the idea that you can't simply bring a stiffener up to a bulkhead and weld it and be done. And I know there's a lot of smart people out there that are listening to this saying, yes, you can absolutely do that. I'm going to come back to this issue about weld area in a second. The final reason though that I really love brackets is it's an easier fit for the shipyard. Uh, steel is not like wood or plastic. Steel does not bend, it does not deflect. You either cut it to exactly the right size or it doesn't fit. Well, that's especially a problem because steel also expands and contracts with heat. Do you know where we find a lot of heat in a shipyard? Welding torches that are running all over the place connecting all of this stuff together. So steel can bend and change shape, and suddenly it's really difficult to do an exact fit. And I wanna do a quick demo to show this. Uh, bear with me while I change the cameras over. Okay. Okay. So here we have an example of just a little 3D plastic 
uh, piece of a ship's structure that I printed up. And you can see here, we have already one stiffener that's been fitted in and some nice little brackets connecting it on the sides. And we have here an example of one bulkhead where we're joining on the flat side. And then we also have over here an example of another bulkhead where we're joining against the stiffener side. And now I have my extra stiffener that I now need to weld in. Now remember, in real life, this is not plastic with a piece of dental floss holding it. In real life, this is a giant steel beam being held by a crane overhead, and it can swing around like this. Um, this right here is hundreds of pounds moving around, or hundreds of kilograms moving around. That's a great way to get injured or killed. So these things are very difficult to control, and also quite a bit of a risk to be maneuvering. And then you go and tell this shipyard worker, that, hey, I want you to take this stiffener, and without a bracket, it has to be cut to exactly the right length, so I want you then take this 200 kilogram stiffener or more and make it an exact fit here in this while you have the crane operator trying to control it from several 10 to 20 meters overhead. Right. I am only about 5 centimeters above this stiffener and you can see I'm having trouble fitting it in and it's catching on quite a bit of the ship's structure. So, yeah. Fitting for a shipyard is quite difficult. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because the, uh, the whole idea is when you're using these brackets, you don't have to make it an exact fit anymore. You don't have to bring things in to be perfectly next to you. Uh, and that's really wonderful. You can actually have your stiffener cut back a short distance from the bulkhead and have your bracket exist to bridge that gap between the stiffener and the bulkhead. And that's perfectly fine. That's not the same as sniping, because in this scenario, my bracket is intentionally sized to just do that duty of carrying along the stiffener. It's meant to be super strong. Okay, now let's get back to our presentation here. So before I said that you need two times the weld area when you're joining a stiffener to a bulkhead, and I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that are saying, no, you're lying, that's not right, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't match what my boss told me. You're correct. So. I want you to take a minute to explain weld strength. There's a common myth out there where people say, oh, the weld is always the weak point in the structure. Um, mostly, they are misrepresenting the way we use the weld. So why are welds considered weak? The weld itself, the filler material from the weld stick that gets placed into the gap between your two pieces of metal, that filler material is actually stronger than the base metal. And that's not really the concern. The geometry of the weld is the concern. So what I'm showing you right here is just a straight um, through penetration weld, with the red being our weld material. And you'll notice it's going straight through the full thickness of the metals, and the stresses just pass straight through that weld on a direct line from the stiffener to the bulkhead. That's a very efficient way to do it. This is not how we usually weld things together on a ship. This is actually somewhat difficult to do. Um, I'm not a welder myself, but I have been told by many welders to, that this takes extra effort, mainly because you're running into the problem that your weld, your filler material, is a liquid for a short amount of time, and it'll just fall out of the gap if you don't have something to hold it for the few seconds that, you're, that it takes for it to solidify. So instead, we normally use this. This is a fillet weld. Now you can see here that our stiffener is coming up to our bulkhead, but not directly touching it. And our weld is not in the gap between the two. We put our weld on the corner, on that intersection 
And that's really convenient for the welder. It's much more easy from a production standpoint, but it's also a terribly inefficient way to use materials. Because we're now asking those stresses to be carried along the stiffener, do a sharp right turn, pass through that diagonal, and then travel into the bulkhead. That's what we call a, a shear stress connection. And without going into all of the nasty math behind it, what you need to know is that steer, shear stress is a very inefficient way to use that material. Shear stress is about 50% as efficient as a direct strength, or as a direct connection. So this fillet connection right here is only about 50% as efficient as this straight direct connection. But we like fillet welds. Fillet welds are quick and they are easy. That is why people say that welds are weaker because we're using them in an inefficient way for the sake of faster production. That is also why we need our brackets because remember here I just said that's 50% of the strength of my metal. Well, okay, if I again start with my stiffener here, the green one that has 10 millimeters squared and I'm only getting 50% out of that and when my actual fillet connection that means I need twice as much area. So that's why we love those brackets. Okay, so I'm going to summarize some everything up now and then we'll go on to some questions. So first off, reviewing the idea of hard spots. Hard spots are not the same as stress concentrations. Stress concentrations are what we prove and know through analysis. Hard, that's the theory end. Hard spots are the practical experience end that tells us this is likely to be a stress concentration. And so we should give that some extra attention and think about how to improve that connection. Uh, the biggest culprit for hard spots is always look at your stiffener connections. Right at the ends is where you'll find the most likely hard spots. Not exclusively there, but those are the most common ones. What's the best solution to hard spots? Well, you really got to think about that end connection detail and how it's going to be, how you're going to transfer the stresses from your stiffener through to your stronger structure. One of the best options, brackets. Love them, use them. You can find all sorts of different ways to put them together. They are an incredibly versatile tool. And I wouldn't know any of this if it wasn't for the theory. I know I talk a lot about how this is all practical and we're trying to limit our theory so that we can do things more efficiently. Here's the thing. The theory is what created these guidelines from the practical end. I'm not looking this stuff up in a book usually. Uh, I'm taking what I know about the theory, applying a little bit of experience of how it's typically done, and that's where we come up with this practical stuff is we're really, ex we're taking the general, or we're taking the specific ideas, generalizing them. And the important part to remember about generalization and general guidelines, they can be wrong. I can tell, you remember how I said hard spots? Hard spots are not proven. There were a lot of, um, going all the way back to our FEA model, all of those spots that I showed you that said, hey, these could be hard spots, yeah, but we had an FEA model that proved they were not a concern. They were below our stress limits for that model. That's theory saying that practical design and guidelines are not always correct. So yes, theory and practical design still absolutely go together. And that's how you get really efficient ship structures that last a lifetime. Thanks very much. And now let's take some questions. So go ahead and type your questions into the chat window and I will answer them as much as I can. And while everybody is thinking of some questions to ask, let's see, there, get my face back here. So one question that was asked uh, earlier 
this was sent to me in comments beforehand, was how to quickly design a pad eye for lifting on a ship. Uh, the first answer is, I'm not sure I've ever quickly designed a pad eye. Uh, the reason is because lifting is a pretty high risk operation. You're going to suspend weights overhead and you're just begging for gravity to prove your folly and bring these expensive things crashing to the ground. So I am personally of the opinion that um, pad eyes are not always a quick endeavor, uh, especially if we're lifting anything that includes people. Uh, usually you need a safety factor of, I think, about six to one for any piece of equipment that's lifting people. But here's some general guidelines on how to design pad eyes. Uh, first off, don't be afraid to go thick. A typical pad eye will be a um, half circle that's got a hole in the center where we would put our crane shackle into, and this half circle will then be welded to the deck of your structure, whatever you're trying to lift. Um, so think about that for a second. If I'm, say, trying to lift 30 tons of weight, I'm concentrating the, for the force of 30 tons of weight into one or two pad eyes. That's a structure that was probably 10 meters in size, and all of that force is being pushed through a little pad eye that's only about 10 centimeters in size. So the first solution is make your pad eye thick. Don't be afraid to go to you know, 20, 25, even 50 millimeters of thick plate on your pad eye. Uh, that's one up, the first trick. Second trick is make sure that you have your pad eye aligned with the angle of the load. That's actually the biggest limitation for pad eyes. Uh, if you don't have it perfectly lined, if we instead just have our pad eye sticking straight up from our structure, but then our crane is pulling sideways here, this is going to bend the pad eye and break it. Not from the direct force pulling, but from the sideways curling over of the pad eye. So you don't want to mount your pad eye straight up and down. You want to find out what are the angles to your crane's hook and weld it onto your ship aligned with those angles. Um, and then certainly this is not a time to use fillet welds for pad eyes. It, you want the full strength of your weld. Use the full penetration welds. I do know that to make this a quicker process, a lot of shipyards will do the theory and the analysis to pre-design several different pad eyes of different rated strengths. And then they just have those designs ready to go and they can cut them out and make them uh, as needed. But that's not the only limitation you have to think about for a lot of these. Uh, for a lot of these pad eyes or, and these lifts, you have to remember that the stresses do not stop at the deck plate. You also have, you know, once you've transferred those stresses through that pad eye, you also have to worry about the ship structure underneath that pad eye. How is that concentrated force from the pad eye being distributed out to the rest of the ship? And whatever is underneath it, can it handle that? Hmm. I actually had uh, one friend, a colleague, that did a wonderful design. And this will be probably the last lesson I would say for pad eyes. If you can, don't use aluminum. It, whenever possible, do not use alum aluminum for pad eyes. Uh, I, I was working with a colleague on a project where the entire boat was aluminum, and we had a requirement to be able to uh, lift the boat with helicopter. Um, th there's this fact, this thing that happens with aluminum. They use heat treatment, uh, preci specifically precipitate hardening, to take your base aluminum alloy and make it stronger. The problem is once you take that heat treated alloy and then weld it, you're putting back heat back in and re eliminating all the heat treatment that made it strong. So your welded aluminum pad eye is actually incredibly weak. I think he had to make, I, I'm digging out of my memory here, but that was a pad eye of exaggerated proportions. If I recall correctly, he had to use eight pad eyes to distribute the stresses to eight different points on the boat, and then we had um, lifting things all coming up to the helicopter. 
but each pad eye was about 50 millimeters thick and each one had to be angled to exactly the right angle to perfectly stay in the line and eliminate any possibility for bending. It was a horrific pain in the butt and we greatly disliked aluminum at that point. So yeah, whenever possible, use higher strength materials for your pad eyes. Steel is a good way to go. And now I see that there's a lot of uh, questions that have come through on the chat. So let me take a second to read those and see what else we can answer. Okay, uh, we have one question um, from, and now we enter the wonderful part of the discussion where I butcher everybody's name. So I, am, uh, I apologize in advance for that. Um, Jamon Cortizas, I hope I, I got that somewhat right, um, asks, the use of brackets that increases the cost and weight, uh, will, it become nor will it be normal to use them in certain areas of the ship then? Uh, I think I see where you're going with, with that question, and I'll see if I can answer it. If I, I miss the answer, just uh, ask another question then, and I'll see if I can get it. But the first part that's really interesting about brackets is that a lot of the times it comes out as a net benefit, actually reducing your cost and weight. And the reason for that is because the bracket itself does add cost and weight. Yes, that is correct. But remember, because of that bracket, my stiffener gets a lot smaller. My can, stiffener can become a smaller size because we are changing our end conditions to more efficiently use our stiffener. And so what happens is I save more cost and more weight by reducing my stiffener than I gain by adding in my brackets. And that's mostly just because the stiffeners are usually much, much longer. Uh, your bracket, even on super big ships, your bracket would be at most 500 millimeters, or you know, 0.5 meters, whereas your stiffener that that bracket is attached to could be uh, 10 meters long. And so that um, is still a net benefit on that end. Uh, where do we use it in the ship? Pretty much at all of your bulkhead connections. Uh, your bottom stiffeners connecting to your bulkhead, you'll definitely use that. Um, actually, I'll go back to, here we go, back to our 3D printed model. Okay. So here's a great example. Um, you can see here we have our stiffener along the bottom and we have a bracket on this end where we are joining the bottom stiffener to the uh, back stiff, the aft stiffener here on that bulkhead. And you can see in this case, it was just lapped onto the sides. And then over on this end, we are also joining from this bottom stiffener up to the face of this bulkhead. Uh, those are very common situations. And what I can say also is if you turn this on its side, uh, that's another scenario where, yeah, let me get this in frame for you. There. Now you can think of that as this is the side shell plating of my ship. Uh, here's another bulkhead and another bulkhead, and these are the stiffeners running along the side of the, the, the ship. And once again, we're using bracket connections there. So pretty much everywhere running around the length of the ship where we have bulkheads joining into uh, bottom plating, you would use brackets. Where you probably will not use brackets is with web frames. Uh, if you have a web frame that is just passing over one of these stiffeners. In those cases, uh, it's usually not worth it to use the bracket because the bracket's going to transfer that bending force and you'd be asking the web frame to then twist, to, uh, to bend like this. And normally the web frames are not strong enough in this direction to, be, to warrant those web brackets. Okay. So, let's see what else we have for uh, questions. And before I get to questions, I'm just trying to find a nice background to work with. 
And we'll start, we'll sit, leave it out there. Okay. Um, next question we have is from James Page. Uh, any recommendations for hull overplating best design practices? Oof. Um, I, I, yeah, I think I can see where you're going with that. So if you have scenarios where you have um, some worn down plate and you want to put some more plate on top to get best design uh, to maintain it. Uh, the first thing I would say is if you are overplating, don't ever depend on the strength of that original plate. Uh, I don't have any specific best design practices. I, I haven't had to do that scenario yet myself. The, the best option is avoid it if you can. Remove bad plate, put in good stuff. There is one option though you could look up. Um, do a search for the Ship Structural Committee. Uh, this is one of my hidden gems of knowledge that I love. The Ship Structural Committee is a roving group that's maintained by the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers. Basically, they have a giant list of best practices publications of how to do all of these little details. Uh, and so you could very likely find a guideline there for overplating on a hull. I know you can find guides on, for example, bracket connections. They, they actually did an intense study. Remember how I said that there are many different ways that you can have brackets, many different shapes? They did a whole study on seeing what are all the shapes out there? What are the best practices? And they surveyed existing vessels. So ship structural committee will be one of your best options there. Uh, let's see, we have... Oh, here's an excellent point from Argonautis. Argonautis. I hope I got that right. Um, Hi, I recall my early days that fatigue life of a joint requires reduction of stress and of course no material flaws or hardness where cracks may propagate. Uh, that's very, very true. So he, he hit all the good points about how you increase your fatigue life is number one, reduce your stress. Uh, the life that you get out of a piece of structure is directly related to how strong, um, how strong your stresses are. And specifically, we're talking about stress ranges. If I was to um, take a stiffener, load it up so that its stress is 90% of its limit, and just hold it there for its an entire lifetime, never change it, fatigue will not happen. You'll never get fatigue on that. What will cause fatigue is if I go up to 90% and then back down to zero, and up to 90% and back down to zero. That kind of flexing is what causes fatigue. And that's why we assume it happens on ships, because ships live in the ocean. Uh, do you know what else is in the ocean? Waves. Waves are always flexing the ship. And so we actually have to worry about the stress range, that distance you know, from zero to 99%, or uh, it can even go negative when we talk about compressive stresses. So yes, reducing the stresses is always the first trick. And then looking at the hardness of the material and the crack propagation, what that's with on, so that's looking at it from the other end. You know, reducing the stress is going easier on your material, making the job easier. Um, the hardness of the material and the look, reducing crack propagation that is improving the quality of your material, letting it handle more. Uh, and, and hardness is especially an important issue because all of that welding makes your material harder and a little more brittle right at the joint of the weld. That's why when we're talking about fatigue failure on ships, the welds are normally the parts that crack first. That's your first sign that you might have a fatigue issue is if you get weld cracking. Thankfully, and this is one of the best points I ever heard about ships, the way we design them is to try and keep everything distributed, keep all of our stresses distributed, and that gives you a major benefit when we're talking about cracking of welds and fatigue failure. Failure. Normally, it will only happen in a couple spots at first. You get a warning sign. You can have some failures that are not critical, that the ship still has enough reserve strength to have a couple broken welds and that's great because that gives you a chance to recognize that there's a need for increased maintenance and it gives you a chance to adjust versus 
oh, the first weld broke and now we have no ship. No, we don't design like that. We always give some reserve margin. Um, oh, wow. I need to stop talking and answering more questions. Um, if you can't get around a hard spot, could you make it less stressed? Uh, that was from Fate Shipping. And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, generally, the way we will make it with less stress is with brackets. Um, you can also do lapped connections. The, the trick that we're doing here is think about the stiffness. Um, as this bracket moves towards the bulkhead, that, the physics thinks that that bracket is now part of the stiffener. And so what we're doing is instead of having a quick change in our stiffness, we are actually slowly increasing the stiffness by adding that bracket in and by increasing the depth of our stiffener because the depth is now from our bottom plate to the top of the bracket. And so that's how we um, distribute and reduce the stress. Uh, we generally, you can't avoid the hard spot. The, the hard spot is just the location. What you do with the hard spot is how you reduce the stress. <laughs> mm, here's another great ex example or um, specific point from Argonautis again. Um, he mentions that normally adding material in a joint attracts stresses. So you want to avoid over designing that for strength because that might result in eventual hardness of the material and finally crack propagation. That's very, very true. So we put material in to try to reduce the stresses, but you have to remember that we have situations like this. Um, with our stiffeners, there's not just one stiffener in isolation. It's sitting next to a whole bunch of them. And if its neighbors say, hey, you know, Bob over here has a really great bracket. He looks beefy. He, this stiffener's been working out. Here, let's give him some of our stress. Well, now Bob is, is suddenly pulling double duty. Uh, and that's, that's very, very true. That's one of the problems. And that's why we are also very careful in our practical design to try to make uniform all of our joints. You know, if you say that this is the bracket that you're going to pick, you're going to put that on all of your joints along this intersection. And so it is a careful balancing act to keep our stresses from concentrating while also looking at the small little connections. So one question from Fate Shipping asks, uh, what about plate thickness? In Europe, they build with eight to 10 millimeters plate, uh, but over the years of usage, this goes down to six to four millimeters of plate. Uh, is that also accounted for in the, for the ship design and building the frame? Yes. So I think specifically you're referring to corrosion there. Uh, we also call that wastage. Simple version, the material gets eats away over time. Uh, salt water is horribly corrosive to steel. And unfortunately, we just haven't invented a better material that's equally cheap. So yes, the structure in your ship actually does get thinner over time. The stiffeners get thinner, the plate gets thinner, and that is because corrosion is reducing them. All of our scantling calculations, all of the sizes that we have for our ships actually do have a built-in additional allowance. So, you know, first we figure out that our stiffener needs to be, for sake of argument, 10 millimeters squared in area. That's our, where we want it to be at the end of 30 to 50 years. And so we then build up from there and say, okay, well, if we want to finish with 10 square millimeters of area, we better start with 15 square millimeters. And the uh, class societies that come out with these scantlings, they even have guidelines in how much you can reduce that stiffener uh, before you have to really worry about the strength. So if you see stiffeners or any piece of structure corroding, that is a sign to monitor. It is not a sign that you are in danger. Uh, there is an allowance built into all of those stiffeners. That being said, when you start seeing them really start to wear down, 
that's where you start asking, is it time to replace this? Let's keep a close monitor on that and look at that in our ship inspections. Um, another question from Giovanni Contrius. Uh, sorry if I got that name wrong. Or, uh, yeah, I probably butchered that. Why is the through thickness property material seldom used in ship's pad eyes as the main material? Uh, I don't think I understand that question well enough to answer that. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think I can give you a, a fair answer on that question. Uh, sorry, I'm going to pass on that part. Um, let's see. Ooh, here we go from Ryan McCann. I hope I got that right. How do honeycomb and lattice reinforcement structures handle fatigue compared to more traditional methods? Ooh, I have not specifically seen that um, study done, but now I really want to. So just well, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually thinking through my theory and applying that to practical ship design. The first thing I would say is the honeycomb and lattice techniques are usually, those reinforcements are more regular. Uh, you're looking at a denser mesh and are of more reinforcements closer spaced together. That already helps reduce any stress concentrations. It's going to lead to quicker distribution. So that will help improve fatigue. But especially if we're talking about, say, a honeycomb pattern uh, where we have uh, hexagons rather than straight rectangles connecting. Uh, sorry, I haven't practiced how to make a hexagon with my fingers, but if you have that, um, talking about the idea of hard spots, you know, when we're talking about traditional ship structure that's basically rectangular, you have everything meeting at right angles. And that pretty much means that you're always transitioning from direct compression along one stiffener to some form of bending stress in the other stiffener, uh, which is always a problem because your direct compression is the stiffest way that you can use a piece of material. Bending is the weakest way that you can use a piece of material. And so that's always why we get those hard spots. A lattice connection, on the other hand, um, you, you're not meeting at a direct right angle. Uh, you're meeting at... Sorry, I'm doing the math in my head. I believe it's 60 degree angle uh, between those two connections in a hexagon. That is going to transfer more of the stresses along as a direct stress rather than a bending connection. So I think if you're looking at honeycombs, you would find much less hard spots, much uh, better fatigue performance. But that's me um, guessing there. And uh, the first thing I would say my official answer would be that is a very interesting question. Let's find a research study to try and prove it. Uh, you're going out of practical design back into theory, and theory says we need to prove things before we use them. Another question from Argonautis. Um, let's see. Yes, he was also mentioning the point that corrosion allowance is usually accounted for in the fatigue design. Um, Let's see. However, the ROB of fatigue life is it's good to assess from time to time. Yep, class requires gauging, which may be used for this. Exactly. Yep. Um, we, I think we both answered the same question there. And that was um, Steve from U, U of M. Excellent. Um, to talk a little bit more about the corrosion allowance, uh, one thing that's really interesting is if you talk about, say, corrosion on a plate, this one, uh, the way we use plates, they are, they're basically just um, more or less meant to be a, a solid membrane that keeps the water out. And so corrosion on this is pretty interesting because it's just a straight reduction in the thickness of the plate. And it's very easy to come up with the math to see, hey, if I take one millimeter off of a plate that was seven millimeters thick, how strong is my plate now? That's a very quick and easy thing to adjust because we're just changing the thickness. Stiffeners, on the other hand, are a lot more difficult because if we look at this stiffener, this has 
a vertical piece right here and then a horizontal piece. Now, if I take one millimeter off of, say, the top here, this top section is doing 90% of the work when it comes to bending strength. So that's way more important than if I take one millimeter off the bottom. But of course, if I take too much off the bottom, I have what we commonly call a hole, and the stiffener collapses. So it's a lot more difficult to assess how corrosion reduces the strength of a stiffener. Uh, you could just say that it uniformly, you know, assume a worst case scenario where we're gonna take one millimeter off of every piece of the stiffener, and that's a good conservative approach, but it might also be too conservative because we know in reality it doesn't happen. In reality, one piece or the other of the stiffener is going to take more corrosion. And so that's in a scenario where if I am looking at the possibility that I might have to spend millions or even billions of dollars to replace all of the stiffeners on my ship, uh, just because some engineer assumed the worst case scenario, that is a situation where you might actually say, okay, let's go out, do a survey of the, shape, of the ship, do gauging, which is um, using ultrasonic sensors to physically measure the thickness of your material. Uh, that's what gauging is. And really get a much better assessment of what is the actual condition of the ship. Uh, you might find out that paying $2,000 or so for a gauging study is a lot cheaper than paying millions of dollars to replace all of your stiffeners. Uh, quick disclaimer here, those prices are not accurate. I I'm guessing random numbers there. But yes, it, the actual pattern of corrosion matters quite a bit when we're doing that. Um, incidentally also, ultrasonic gauging, that's just cool. Th those are so much fun. Uh, the, it's actually just a little probe that you hold up to the side of your structure and it will send out a little tiny ultrasonic sound wave through the um, structure. Y you can't hear it, it's above human, human hearing range. Uh, and then based upon, it works basically the same principle as sonar, uh, just going through solid structure instead of through the ocean. And they've got some really advanced methods. The reason you care about that most is, you know, you might think, well, why don't I just get some calipers and measure the thickness here? Ultrasonic gauging is really great when you're talking about things like this bottom plate, because you only need to have access to one side. And so, yeah, those are just some really awesome, fun devices. Okay, um, I believe we are running out of questions. Uh, let's see, it's almost noon, uh, my time at least. So I'm going to say last call for questions. Uh, I'll give you about 30 seconds to start typing for some questions. And then if not, we'll end the chat. Do, 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 do. And now here's where I try to f fill 30 seconds of dead space. <laughs> Incidentally, this, uh, this FEA here was actually a pretty fun one to do. And talking about the hard spots, uh, it's a little hard to see from this picture, but you can actually see that uh, the, in the upper right corner there, they actually did try to reduce the hard spots by having the stiffeners slowly curving into each other and kind of making the stiffener behave like a bracket. And even in that scenario, uh, that was so highly loaded that we still saw some stress concentrations. But I can tell you, because I did the FEA, that these, the, the spots that you see that are red, they're still below the limits for that structure. It was perfectly safe. Okay, well, I think if there are no other questions, I'm just going to say thank you very much. Uh, there were some excellent questions. They were really fun to work with and hear everybody's feedback. And uh, hopefully I'll plan some more of these live streams so that we can discuss other topics. Thanks very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect.